Hmm, I don't know how to solve it because, to be honest, um, I, I have uh, I have this microphone and I have nothing that would uh, that would do any sound. So let me know in the comments. Ah, it's good now. Good, thank you. Okay, oh. <laughs> nervousness. Let's uh, let's get it away. So. Uh, this information is information that is being deliberately distorted and then, of course, secretly, ideally, I will get that leaked into the communication process in order to deceive or manipulate. Important thing is that it's not an outright lie. It's distorted information. And as you will uh, learn with me later, it's actually good to put there a hint of truth because then it's more uh, believable. And what we uh, with disinformation campaigns are trying to strive for, uh, I, won't, I won't start again. Uh, it's, uh, or do you really want to start again? I, I was just uh, making jokes about my cat. So let's, let's not complicate this. Um, uh, wh where was I? <laughs> Come on, <laughs> admin, <laughs> stop writing me there. Um, uh, what you want to do is put there a hint of truth because it's really not about forcing someone into believing you or trusting you. It's really the subtle manipulation that you start to believe into something that you wouldn't originally or that you stop believing there is actually something like a truth, which is very helpful for uh, disinformation manipulators. I will get to that, I will get to that later on too. Uh, I often hear that it's very similar to propaganda, that hey, we already had disinformation in the past. It was called propaganda. Now, just because we are in an online space, we call it differently. It's not actually true. Propaganda, in its definition, is not a highly organized attempt. It's just a very brutal, forced uh, attempt to convince you to believe something. It's not about deceiving. I know there, there is very uh, subtle difference there, uh, but let's say that uh, with propaganda, it's, it's more like 1984 that Orwell described, you know, uh, you are publishing a lot of leaflets or in Harry Potter uh, when there's undesirable number one, you know, and there is the raid against muggles in uh, number seven. Sorry, uh, <laughs> stupid examples, but um, this is really propaganda leaflets, like pushing into the heads of people with all the brute force of media and everything you have, that this is the only truth. With this information, it's not that you uh, are actually forcing onto someone your truth. You are maybe just dissolving the truth or you are hinting that it might not be as it seems. You're really just deceiving and manipulating. So that's the, that's the uh, difference that I wanted to uh, describe. Then there are uh, plenty of uh, more other terms that I wanted to uh, go into, as you can see on the slide. Uh, I hate the term fake news. Please, please, if you have uh, to take one thing from this uh, presentation, please stop using the, fa fa the term fake news. It doesn't mean anything anymore. It may might have had a peak shine uh, in the in the past, but now it really doesn't mean anything. Uh, it's it's just a loaded term. Uh, nobody knows uh, what to what to put under that, so they are putting everything under that. Both disinformation, both propaganda, both misinformation, both lies, lies, uh, which is not correct. So I think it's best to stop just using it and start to really define the correct terms that are really specifically pointing out towards a specific problem. So. Another thing uh, are hoaxes. Uh, hoax in the past, and of course even now, from the uh, point of the word, meant, um, uh, meant also like false information or some manipulation. Right now, scholars and people like me, so people included in the, in the debate, are starting to say that this, this definition should stay rather with disinformation and hoax should be considered as a tool of disinformation campaigns. Is it really a specific piece of deceiving information? Uh, and uh, thirdly, what I would like to mention is misinformation and it's very important to not uh, mix it with disinformation because misinformation is false information that is simply wrong irrespective of whether someone uh, did it on purpose or just by accident uh, or whether it's really like genuine or criminal incompetence so uh, 
if you see if you see something that seems like a false information on the internet it doesn't mean that the person deliberately put it there or that the person really believes it or whatnot uh, it might be just misinformation and of course they are extremely important in the debate and in the whole fight because because my mobile phone went down for that just for this piece of information um, uh, that uh, it's very very subtle difference between then censoring people that are really trying to do harm to you or society and people that just believe something or, or just share something and uh, we of course want want freedom of speech so we can't censor them so there is really subtle line so it's very important to understand the differences let's get on with this when we have our definitions oh sorry great uh, I will come. I will get to uh, disinformation campaigns playbook in the next slide. But before that, so that it doesn't seem like a whole bunch of theory, I would like to present you uh, one example. It's my, it's my favorite. I love it. Uh, I know it's disinformation campaign, so I shouldn't love it. But it's very, very fun to watch, and there are all the playbook like rules applied, and it was a huge one. So. You might have heard that uh, the US uh, invented uh, AIDS, HIV virus. Uh, if you've heard it, you were also targeted by a Russian, sorry, Soviet disinformation campaign uh, that unfolded infold, uh, in uh, 80s. It was actually run by Soviet KGB. Uh, KGB actually, or uh, the former leader uh, acknowledged that it was uh, a disinformation campaign yet until this day plenty of people believe uh, that AIDS was created as a biological weapon sometimes uh, the details get lost so some people think it's just biological weapon of someone being Russia being US being Europe whomever or that it's uh, created by US as a biological weapon and then it uh, differ differs again was it against its own people or was it against the Soviet Union or what not so as you can see it was really huge and now to the examples of the playbook that was like the, the rules that were applied for this disinformation campaign to be successful so first uh, this information appeared first in 60s in Indian newspaper. The Indian newspaper has been later known as established by KGB and acknowledged as, as pretty much just pure disinformation channel. Something as we now have, you know, uh, some uh, your typical disinformation uh, newspaper and online portals. Uh, at that time, uh, KGB had its, uh, and it of course it has till now, has its uh, uh, newspapers uh, across the world. So one of them was in India, and they planted their you know piece of information uh, that. Uh, uh, this might have happened in US laboratory that this might have been created then they did nothing with that it was just there planted you know as for for for, uh, for later use later uh, in the 80s there has been apparently a decision in the top tier of KGB that they should start to use it so uh, they spread it through their other newspapers through their other satellites it appeared i think in bulgaria it appeared uh, also in central europe uh, and it spread and spread like wildfire because they supported it by you know many of these outlets so it was a combination and of course it was also interesting what helped it was uh, that one of uh, very uh, one one of US uh, US scientists uh, published a paper claiming that yes this is right and he has proofs and everything uh, nobody knows till now as far as I know uh, if he was just a useful idiot or if he wanted to be famous or if he was actually bright by the KGB but he served well because now you had plenty of uh, information coming from all directions without knowing where it came from that this is happening and then you have even scientists who are confirming it in the US so uh, then the disinformation starts to live its own life and uh, then a special task force task force has been actually established to debunk it and they succeeded and they found out you know all the way till the Indian uh, publishing newspaper 
So uh, that's my favorite one. It, called, it was called Operation Infection. I don't know if I said it at the beginning, but as you can see, and it is successful pretty much till now, because till nowadays, because as you uh, as you might have heard it, those who are more inclined, let's say, to not believe uh, in the well broadly accepted truth or how to say it and i'm not saying that it's ba uh, bad to trust in some conspiration theories I, w I will be always the one who will say uh you know don't trust anything and uh, uh review your information but those who are more inclined to trust conspiration theories without any you know acceptance might still believe this sorry my english is a little bit off today, but I believe that that you understand me. It's not like <coughs> Miss Shilerva, I hope. <laughs> anyway, now to the playbook, just to really explain how is it done and what you can expect that will hit you. I think it's very important to know what can hit you. Uh, there's co it's called something uh, active measures. I prefer to call it a disinformation playbook because it's more sexy, and then you can also fight it with your own playbooks. Uh, it's uh, drafted by US experts, also those who uh, fought the disinf uh, disinformation campaigns in the past, and it's called also sometimes Russia Playbook. But I really don't think that just because they are doing the biggest operations in the past means that nobody is doing this now, and also that just Russia, or sorry, Soviet Union created this in the past. It was really a common work of plenty of people who wanted to spread this information. So, first, find the cracks in the target society. It is really uh, important to know what is uh, right now at the targeted society something that divides the society. Um, at that point of time where Operation Infection uh, was used. Why it wasn't in the 60s? Because in the 60s there wasn't this kind of crack between those who were uh, more and more rich and could afford uh, health insurance and stuff like that and those who were poor. In the 80s it started to even more graduate, so it was one of the cracks. Of course there there has been more division among like trust in the government, you know, which is hugely important. I will also talk about it later. Um, if your society doesn't really trust the government, then uh, they will believe that the government is actually trying to invent a biological weapon against you. If you had uh, a society where uh, people trust in government, of course they wouldn't trust it. Like, of course they wouldn't believe the disinformation. Like, why would they? That that's just bizarre, you know. So you need to find a crack and emphasize these divisions. Again, something uh, to put uh, into present day. Uh, I'd say that in our society you could see it, uh, or I will now speak about Czech Republic, sorry to all of you who are listening from different countries, but in the Czech Republic we had, for example, presidential elections. And uh, for some reason uh, there has been uh, an open question, open question I think like five years ago already, about Benes Dikrets. Uh, it was something uh, regarding uh, the the borders of the Czech Republic and whether they should be given back to Germany or not, you know, the so-called uh, Sudeten. Uh, and, uh, well, it was really, really long time after, after the end, after, you know, everybody uh, went home or didn't go home. Of course, it was a sensitive topic, but it was so old that uh, nearly like third of the population they didn't even, even remember. But it was put out on the table as a topic in the presidential campaign, uh, you know, that maybe Germany will want to take from us the, the border part again, you know, to, to uh, the, cancel the Benesh decrets. And uh, even though it was ridiculous, there was something, some crack in the society, the fear that yes, uh, the Germans will take it from us, you know, or, or it may be even kind of a shame of how it unfolded in the past because it was quite violent, uh, that uh, people just freaked out about it. And it actually helped to win one of the uh, presidential candidates, the elections. So it's not just for disinformation campaigns, it's also for uh, society manipulation and PR. Uh, and please don't take it as, as advices, okay? Uh, second, is create a big, bold lie that no one could possibly believe it was made up. Operation Infection is a great example of that. Uh, like, 
it's really bizarre how why would you trust that but it's so big it's so bold that you can't really not trust it because hey even if like 80% of this wasn't true, still 20% could be, right? And you start to think about the 20% and what could be the... That's what uh, the disinformation campaigns want to really start for, uh, for you to get confused about what's what's reality, what not. Uh, then, I already talked about it, uh, third, uh, third advice or rule is to wrap the lie around a kernel of truth. And that's really important because um, when you put there something that already uh, exists, people tend to uh, put it into their existing framework of mindset and start to trust it uh, e more easily. For example, you might have heard about Pizzagate, so-called Pizzagate. Uh, it was during the last presidential elections in the US, Trump uh, versus Hillary Clinton. And uh, there has been a campaign against Hillary Clinton called Pizzagate, claiming that she runs a covered operation uh, where she pretty much in a basement of some pizza restaurant she uh, hol holds uh, uh, kids to sell for pedophiles or something crazy like that so there you have it a big bold lie like what the hell why would Hillary Clinton sell kids in the basement of pizzeria uh, to pedophiles or what the actual hell uh, and then the kernel of truth the, the, the leaked emails actually uh, contained uh, some pizzeria where there actually uh, was a pizza place there. So, hey, it exists. Uh, it actually didn't have a basement, but who would, uh, who would check that, right? And also some, some other hints like, yeah, this person she talked to exists and they were ordering something and it kind of sounded like they might order kids yeah I know now it sounds crazy but you know when you are in the in the run and uh, especially the elections one anything can hurt you and this hurt her greatly actually and might have caused that she lost in the end so yeah um, four conceal your hand I uh, talked about this at the beginning with operation infection uh, they already had several satellites, uh, the Soviet Union, uh, where they could spread the disinformation and then just take it and act as if it was from the Indian newspaper, it wasn't from Soviet Union, you know. Uh, so that, that's really important for the long run. Of course, it's not like core part of successful disinformation campaign. Uh, it can go already with the first three points, but it is if you want the disinformation to last really long and for no one to really know what is the truth and it also if you conceal your hand properly it helps to spread the narrative that you know the, the opponents of yours are just trying to destroy you and your credibility and that you are the victim and that's very useful if you want to then manipulate uh, the society or the audience more fifth point uh find a useful idiot i was talking about this uh it can be like bribing scientists or finding susceptible politicians uh I had there in uh, brackets Trump as an example. Uh, I don't want to sound like, you know, just a pure Trump hater or whatever. Uh, he's doing his politics. I disagree with it. I might disagree with it, but this presentation is not about it. But his Twitter, especially, is like one huge, huge plethora of disinformation. It's really amazing uh, to even look at it. Uh, if someone tried, and I think that there are societies, organizations in America, if someone tried to really debunk everything he writes there or everything he ever says, uh, it's like lie after lie or misinformation or disinformation after one. It's crazy. So, yeah, Trump is actually spreading to his, uh, I don't know, is it millions? Maybe thousands of followers, uh, hundreds of thousands of followers, uh, disinformation for free. Like, which disinformator wouldn't want such a useful idiot? Sorry, sorry to offend any watching Americans uh, who like him, but uh, really just debunk some of his tw uh, tweets. You would be surprised how many lies are there. Six, very important after concealing your hand, deny everything. Deny, then deny again, then deny again. It's really important because, again, it dissolves what is really true. If you, if you really accept it, like, yeah, okay, we spread it, which <coughs> sometimes happens, as we see with operation infection, but uh, if you really deny everything, nobody really has ever 
complete proof that you did it and what you actually did, which is great for dissolving the truth and for confusing your audience. It's so really deny. And of course, seven, I talked about it too already, played long term. Long -term. Uh, of course, Soviet Union started already in the past, in the 60s, 50s, maybe even sooner. Yes, probably during uh, war already, so much sooner. Uh, so they had, of course, some you know tactics, rules, know-how, but it's also about knowing that you are playing the long game and about investing large resources, financial, human resources, everything into this. Until now, they actually have so-called troll farms or troll factories, you might have heard about it, uh, where there are actually employees getting paid for creating, according to this rule book, uh, disinformation campaigns. And uh, that's why so many of them succeed, because it's also about quantity, not just quality. You've heard so plenty of them, you're like, oh, maybe they know what they are doing, you know. No, it's just so overwhelming amount that some of them really have to get to. You. And that's the long game that you are really thinking not like, oh, one quality is information and it will do it, you know, that will destroy the society. It won't. But the constant creation of narrative that there is nothing like truth and constant flow of this information will, uh, to some extent, uh, disrupt every society. So that would be the playbook. Uh, please don't, uh, don't do this. <laughs> It's not, uh, it's not, those are not advices for you to follow. Those are advices for you to know what we are countering and what we are facing. So, okay, now we are already tired, I, I guess, but uh, what to do? Uh, and of course, feel free to ask any questions. Uh, what to do? Uh, I'm now in the European Parliament, so I will talk from that point of view. Of course, there are many other things that the uh, countries can do separately, but I honestly believe that this is a task for uh, the well global world, for not only European Union, but also for the US to come together and come with a solution. And I'm not talking just about them, but for example about Ukraine or the whole region of Eastern Partnership. Those are people that are actually target of disinformation for mo many, many years before the US even started to receive their first, you know, patches. Uh, and they already know what to do about it more, so we can really help each other and uh, share the know-how on to how, to how to fight it. But now for, uh, for what I, let's say, came up with and want to do. I actually want to do a draft a piece of legislation. European Parliament doesn't have a legislation initiative, but I can then uh, lobby the commissioners who has it and uh, I, can, I can spread the word. Uh, also why I want to do it, and now I will talk about the points, uh, is that it's a really great example because we are really lacking any form of let's say, approach to it. And it's really problematic because it then forces the corporations to do something about it. And of course, if you have a corporation which sole reason to exist is to create money, to decide what is truth and what to censor and what not, uh, then you have a problem. But that is what is happening right now because politicians are afraid of the topic, so they are pushing the responsibility onto the corporations. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg uh, was in the Munich Security Conference uh, uh, last year. And he was one of the most, you know, important people there. He had the prime speaking time. Why? Well, because the politicians don't know how to force him to do something or want to force him to do something. Uh, but he shouldn't be the prime time speaker. It should be the politicians who have the responsibility from democratic elections, right? But now for, for the disinformation law. Now for why I spoke at the beginning about the importance of definitions why I think that it is important to have such a law, such a piece of legislation is because there would be finally definitions. Now when I meet even like experts in the field and I'm already quite, let's say, in the field too, even so I wouldn't call myself an expert yet, um, 
when I talk to them, first, what we need to do is to sit down and just, you know, make definitions, like what we are actually talking about to each other, because there are not really existing ones yet. And that's crazy. Like if even we who are already on some level of expertise need to first define what we are talking about, then how the society should understand what is going on and what hit them. Uh, I, I prefer to also use a road example, so-called road example. If you wanted to make some new legislation regarding, uh, I don't know, first class uh, roads and highways and pavements, uh, well, you first need to define what is a highway. Well, now, if you have a driving license, you probably already have now a definition of highway, you know, and how to behave on that. Uh, you have probably a definition of pavement. But you need to have those definitions. If you just said, well, we need to do something and said, well, yes, on something, something, uh, cars can drive 120 kilometers per hour. And then they drove on pavements because there wasn't a proper definition of where they can actually drive this then it will be a mess, right? And this is the same thing with this information, even though it might seem like, ah, oh, again, some, you know, bureaucratic papers full of definitions and terms, it's really important, especially if you are doing for the first time something like that, you need to define what you're talking about so that you can then talk about it. Second point, which I think is vastly important, is a balance, uh, balanced approach. That's what I talked about uh, when I said that politicians are forcing corporations to do something. I think that there should be actually three actors and all should be equally involved. Of course, there should be the corporations uh, or the platforms, the online world, you know, included, uh, those stakeholders, uh, because those are the ones who are offering the services of spreading information. That's absolutely understandable. They should be included in the process. Uh, then there should be governments because they have democratic mandate from voters to decide to do something about it. Uh, there should be politicians included in the process. Third, and of utmost importance in my opinion because a lot of people are forgetting about them are users are actually people who are using the services who are receiving the information and who has now no control over over received information or their data i will get to that uh, in another point but i think that what the let's say legislation of what we should actually create is a platform where these three would be uh, would be represented and could come together something like a huge working group uh, in each state or in each entity as european union and to discuss what to do about it and what's best for each you know even european union works on this triangle principle like commission council and European Parliament and it kind of divides similarly so that's why I kind of am thinking in these you know uh, roads whatever <laughs> road example um, third thing I think that uh, we need to focus on the fact that there are already two uh, ways which to go and that is short term and long term and I think that we should go both ways and it's really important because a lot of people when they realize that this information is a huge problem they start to panic and say okay so we need to do something and they usually start to do uh, bad things like censor information or uh, try to censor the whole internet or try to do upload filters everything we don't really like uh, and they forget completely that there is also a long term approach that hey we could actually I don't know, start to educate people or something like that, you know? So I think that we should focus on both. In short term, uh, as I said already, platform including all actors that will somehow come together. Of course, I don't have specific answer on how it could look, but I think we need to talk about the way we are going, the direction. Uh, secondly, as I said, I think that now people can't really control their data. And I understand because corporations, it's not really, uh, it's not really beneficial for them to give people their data and the information about them. But really, if you can handle your data and uh, what is happening to that, then you are already more, uh, let's say, informed, can make more informed decision and can know what's being served to you. That's connected to the third point, which is transparency of algorithms. Facebook, for example, already now did something um, quite good 
which is that if you if uh, there is uh, an advertisement you can click and see who paid for it uh, the organization has to be registered somewhere in facebook database so you can actually see who owns it or something like that and why they targeted you which is great you can't really control uh, that they target you which is in my opinion not really not really okay but uh, about business model we can talk later uh, in questions but uh, if you if you can know who's targeting you why they are targeting you even in normal posts or um, you know especially in advertisement because that is of course what's spread even more uh, then you can start to work with the information completely differently right uh, if i just see some information i'll be like yeah okay um might be true might not and i'm already like a lot uh uh, uh not not trusting let's say uh but if i actually can check who's trying to sell me their bullshit uh pardon my french then uh i i'm enabling myself or it's enabling me to counter this information myself and not you know uh not to put the responsibility on some corporation and government telling me hey this is true no i can then more easily uncover what is really true Long term is of course connected to that. Uh, it's media literacy mainly and working with received information. It's a huge topic, but everybody is afraid to jump right into it because it's a huge reform. It's a huge reform for education. It's a huge reform even even for third age education and for working with people. But it's immensely important, and we need to be not be afraid of that. And I think again that the European Union can you know can help from this point of view can uh, push for this topic more uh, from its European uh, level because uh, I, I think it will be even more beneficial because if just each country will try uh, to reform their education in terms of media literacy, I don't think it will be the best uh, best version we can get into. But I think that with, uh, uh, with cooperation on European level, we can. So that is kind of what I'm trying to strive for and I'm hoping that you know people will kind of like jump onto the wagon with me and help me. Okay, what I want you to remember before we go into questions, if you ha have any, by the way, you can already put there. If you don't, no problem. We can also just uh, switch it up. Uh, what I want you to remember, apart from, this inf apart from not using fake news, please, is that uh, there is not a simple answer. And if anybody is trying to sell you one, they are lying. Uh, a lot of people are like, okay, countering this information, that is easy, we will do it like that. Or yes, countering this information, we need to censor that or upload filters and everything. No, really. The more I get into the topic, the more I see how much we don't actually know and how much we can't know without trying to do something. And it will be immensely dangerous, but immensely important to take the step and to go into some direction but there isn't really any any simple offer any simple solution that will just solve it so uh and especially for me as you know the pirate uh there is also the silver lining uh, that we of course don't want to censor stuff and everything uh which some people would use as a solution but it also doesn't mean that we need to watch you know other countries or uh, internal actors to destroy our societies we need to do something about this information uh i know that a lot of pirates actually told me sometimes well yeah but it's more important you know to have a free share of information and i completely agree that free sharing of information is something that we are built on but it also disinformation are destroying our societies. So that's why I had the previous slide trying to explain what would be my approach. But of course, feel free to come up with your approaches and let's discuss together on some platforms. Because I think that the information age is really challenging, uh, but also it's great. So let's keep it and let's protect it and let's work with that, what we have. So as I was saying earlier, I'm not the best MEP, but I'm trying to do my best. So. Thank you for listening very much and now i will give you like uh, wait what made my full well we have like 20 minutes for questions but i see that there are not plenty so i will just read what i got and then we might end it <laughs> thank you okay so being able to control who receives and handles your information seems like quite a burden knowledge wise 
Do you think it is possible to teach an ordinary man the value and importance of it? Uh, when I say that uh, people should, uh, when I say that people should have control over their information, what they receive, and who's giving it to them, and you know the really knowledge knowledge wise burden, I'm not saying that all people would want to use it. Of course, I'm just saying that this, uh, let's say, option needs to be put out there right now it's uh, very not beneficial for the businesses so of course they are not giving you the option to even opt out for example from advertisement or something because that's that's what they are living off right uh, but i think that the option should be there yes opt, opt out is a really good term for that uh, but it doesn't mean that everybody will use it or that everybody has to use it it's the same with digitalization you know uh, sorry to jump from another topic but it's really the same example uh, when we are speaking about digitalization it doesn't mean that we will throw over uh, uh, everybody who don't know how to use email or something you know uh, it, it's the typical argument like oh so what will you do you know with pensioners uh, they will just they will just have to le le learn the email. No, there will still be, you know, paper versions, and there still will will be also digitalization for digitization for those who want it. So uh, that's the same thing with this uh, burden of uh, information. Uh, those who want it can have it. Those who don't want it, there will be a, a whole another network uh, of, uh, of, let's say, uh, um, measures. Uh, that will protect the person if the person doesn't want to uh, bear the burden. Plus, of course, uh, the long-term approach should ensure that it won't be such a burden that for people it will be more natural to work with information, that it won't be like, oh, so many information, such a burden, uh, let the government say what I should think. No, it should be like, again, the combination of the triangles, like you should have the opportunity to work with the information, you should have the education to know how to do it, and you should also have some safety measures that will protect you in case you just decided you don't want to do it, bear the burden or something like that. So yes, that would be like my answer. Um, I don't see any more questions. I will, I will drink some water. And another uh, question. You don't have to propose questions as just for questions. <laughs> Is there any fun disinformation you have heard about yourself? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, well, yeah, actually, well, I person, sorry, I personally enjoyed it because, well, of course, there is still the general ones, you know, like, oh, you want to bring there all the migrants to destroy our society, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, uh, but those are more general and more against our party, but against me specifically, and it actually came from uh, from Russian trolls naturally was when i was uh, on holiday last uh, august in georgia and uh, well it really was just holiday so for me i didn't really like care about some you know details or i, I wasn't really careful about properly uh, let's say properly building up what i'm doing you know so uh, i went to georgia and i profoundly enjoyed it and then i contacted you know some people that i knew from uh, people in czech republic and uh, i asked them hey like what's you know because even if i'm on holiday i still kind of care about politics and i knew that you know i'm starting the term as new mep and eastern partnership and georgia will be my topic so i wanted to learn more you know and i was like hey who to talk if i want to know more about the political situation in georgia and they pointed me towards egor koruptev which uh, is uh, i think leader of free russia foundation it's uh, well it's very much Russians in Georgia uh, who would like to see more democracy in Russia, something like that. And uh, he focused focused a lot on on the borders where uh, Russia occupies uh, the South Ossetian region. And uh, so I contacted him like, hey, what's the situation there? And I think it was like Sunday and it was like, and I was leaving on Tuesday and it was like, oh, what you are doing on Monday? And uh, I told him, well, I could go to Tbilisi again and just sightsee or something. And it was like, oh, and do you want to go to the border? And I was like, oh my God, sure, sure, I want to go to the border. So it was really sudden, not planned. And but it, like, come on, I was just on holiday and wanted to see the border. So I went there, 
and uh, he kind of ensured that uh, because he had some contacts that as an MEP that I could go there and that there might be some journalists and I was like yeah sure <laughs> he will ensure that there will be journalists and there were actually they weren't there probably for me I'm pretty sure about it uh, they were there for a politician that actually was the first politician to go there from any politicians for after like week of the borderization started which is crazy because everybody was on holiday but even more so the journalists were keen to talking talk to me you know because I was like the second one and European politician so they were like ooh, crazy so then it got into news and I shared it and it got pretty big and suddenly a huge portion of people started to t tell me that uh, I, I wasn't even in Georgia that um, this this could be taken anywhere you know this fence could be taken in Czech Republic and I we don't believe you and I was like yeah sure I have full phone of photos from Georgia but sure it's it's fake news sorry I, I use the term but uh, I wanted to show how stupid it is and uh, yeah, that uh, a lot of disinformation regarding this, like that I wasn't in Georgia, that I wasn't at the borders if I was in Georgia, uh, that it was all set up because there were journalists and why would there be journalists? Like, uh, I know that from the, you know, perspective or really someone who wasn't there, it might have seemed bizarre. And this sometimes happens to me, but uh, it really happened like that. Uh, and of course I have like proofs, but also uh, since then I really make sure that if I want to report about something then I make sure that I have like solid argument and solid proofs uh, to counter this uh, because of course the trolls were paid or were put there to, to do this, to dissolve the truth but then there were really like people uh, solemnly not knowing whether to trust me or not. So for them, I'm really uh, trying now to be more careful about how I present the information, even though I know it's true. Of course, I know that uh, I can't ask from you uh, to trust me blindly, which is also good that no, you are not doing that, you know, but it's really fun. So sorry for a long story. Another question. Hi, Katarina. Hey, what is being done in the EU around this information? Uh, well, the uh, right now, uh, actually, uh, the the portfolio uh, is uh, under Czech Commissioner Vera Jourova, and uh, I'm trying to set up a meeting with her. But of course, now in the coronavirus uh, coronavirus days, it's much harder. So if any for, uh, anyone from her team is watching. Please, let's do it. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, and uh, before that, so of course, even because of coronavirus, she didn't start uh, working on it yet that much. So I'm not sure what she's planning in that field. But uh, the commission in general uh, unfolded a lot of its own, let's say, like playbooks, uh, like what to do. Uh, how to counter this information, best practices and stuff like that for each of institutions and even like countries. Of course, it's again just recommendation, so it's not something that could be forced. I really want to do legislation, not just recommendation, uh, but it's something. Commission is really, uh, really realizing that it is a problem. Also, it has uh, under external action uh, service I think it's called like that, uh, um, uh, EU versus disinfo.eu, I think, uh, platform where they are really trying to debunk uh, disinformation or EU. Sorry, I, I might put into a chat later the, the specific uh, website, I'm not sure, but they are debunking that uh, under directly under the commission and the high representative, Mr. Borrell. So I think they are in general doing also quite a good work. There has been some controversies now about China lobbying uh, reports on coronavirus, but otherwise really they they are doing their job in debunking. So if you ever encountered, encountered any EU level disinformation, I'm guessing that it will be already debunked on this page, so I'm highly recommending to go there and look into it. But of course, uh, even like we need to do something. So as, as I said, I'm now trying to, let's say, inform myself as much as possible to become a real expert and then try to, to uh, draft the piece of legislation and then uh, try to push it and lobby and, and start to involve more experts. Uh, okay. Well, now we have the playbook, so we can start some. <laughs> Parental advisory. <laughs> Please don't use this information playbook. 
Okay, um, I see there are no, uh, no more questions, so maybe as the last point I will just mention some uh, people and resources and sources that I find highly interesting and I also used for, uh, well, my knowledge from which I dra drafted this presentation. Uh, I think that really, uh, really good, uh, oh, I hope that I will remember the names, wait a second, I will write it. <laughs> uh, uh, ah, yes, uh, from uh, Mr. Pomerantsev, uh, book This is Propaganda, I think it's uh, really good uh, on the topic, and he's actually describing the various, uh, various methods that these informators can use. Then, New York Times had wonderful uh, and plenty of pieces of this information. Actually, I, uh, I used the playbook pretty much from uh, what New York Times put together. I think there is also a YouTube video that they created on Operation Infection. Let's try to find it from New York Times. It's, it's really 40 minutes uh, of, uh, well, a lot of what I already told you, but put together with very nice graphics and uh, very well, very well crafted and drafted. They come into different uh, conclusions than I do, but like, that, that's just a matter of opinion how to counter it, of course, but it's really uh, a good one. Then I would uh, really, uh, so really uh, suggest to sub uh, follow uh, Alex Tamos, who is actually former chief of security in Facebook. Now he works for Stanford University and he's pretty much using both of these uh, experiences, like now, you know, the more scientist approach and, uh, or scholarship, what's it, scholar, scholar and uh, the, the actually practical one that he was in there, he was where they encountered all the disinformation and everything. And now he's working on a lot of papers and a lot of solutions. And I visited uh, uh, several of his presentations and he really knows what he's talking about. So follow Alex Tamos if you want to know also more from really the practical field and point of view. So uh, I see there are no more questions. So this, this would be like advices. And thank you for listening for today. Uh, I hope you'll learn, learn something and it will be useful for you, even maybe to talk to your relatives or friends and to tell them uh, what's, uh, what's really going on in this field and what can be done and can be done by us. So. Thank you and cheers. <laughs>